section, we're going to talk about HTTP method item potency. In the cloud computing world, the, it's all about remaining fault tolerant in the face of failures. And network requests can fail for a myriad of reasons. Um, and if one thread gets an unhandled exception, that can kill the whole process with all the threads that are working on requests that are coming in simultaneously. Or of course, some hardware failure can occur. The power supply can go bad, the hard disk can go bad, a router somewhere in the data center can go bad. Scaling down, you might have 100 machines that are running your service, and then you wanna scale it down to 60 machines running your service. Well, that means that 40 machines, you wanna take them offline so they're not running your service anymore. There are ways to do that in a graceful fashion so they can complete the requests that are processing, but some orchestrators won't do that. They'll just kill those services, which means any requests that they were currently processing, they just stop right away. Um, a code upgrade. Maybe you have 10 computers that are all running version one of your service and you wanna upgrade that version one code to version two. So the way a lot of times that works is that the version one code comes down, the version two code comes up. Well, when the version one code comes down, it could be processing some client requests at that time, and now those clients won't get a response back if it's just killed in the middle. The orchestrator might do some virtual machine balancing. For whatever reason, in the data center, the orchestrator might be running your, your service on this node over here and decide that it wants to move it from this node to another node. And that's completely out of your control to have that happen. Usually it doesn't happen frequently, but it might. And when it does, the service will just come down from the old VM and then start up on the new VM. Any client requests that we're processing will just be halted. Of course, timeout. I highly recommend that if you're trying to build a robust client application, that whenever you make a request to a service, you include a timeout so that if the service doesn't reply, your client doesn't hang indefinitely and you can give response, some response back to your customer who's calling into you. So it is possible that your client makes a request in the service and before the service is working great, but before it sends a response back, your client has timed out and you don't get the response at all. Sometimes the server was taking a long time and the client might wanna retry the operation to go and try it again. Server throttling is another example where the client makes requests to the service, but the service just says, I'm too busy now. And so it just denies the request immediately. Again, that's a time where the client might wanna retry the operation. Maybe it waits a little bit first and then retries the operation in order to get a response. And then of course, just a regular network outage. Today, a lot of things are running on Wi-Fi or cellular networks. There's a lot of client code that's being put in automobiles. A car could drive through a tunnel or go into a parking garage. And all of a sudden, the network connection that was working so good has now just vanished. And then the car comes out of the tunnel or leaves the parking garage. The network connection comes back up and we would like to continue going as if everything was smooth and these failures are not adversely affecting the whole experience. So the bottom line of all of this is that a client makes a request to a service and it doesn't get the response that it's looking for. So what is a client to do? Well, the best practices says that a client code must retry to compensate for these kinds of failures. So the client makes a request, it maybe times out or gets a failure, it will just retry the request again. But that means that multiple requests are coming into the service. And we don't want the service to do the same thing twice necessarily. So the service code must implement its operations item potently. The formula that I like to say to others is what I show at the bottom of the slide here. In order to get exactly one semantics that is accomplished in a cloud computing world where we're embracing failures by having the client do retry operations against the service and the service implementing those operations in an item potent way. This puts a big burden on you, the service developer, because you have to make sure that your service operations are implemented in an item potent way. So let's talk about that. The HTTP specification requires that most HTTP methods be implemented in an item potent way. So the spec already says that this has to be done, and so this burden is already on you. However, in cloud scenarios, all operations must be item potent. 
You see, in the original, back in the early days, when the HP spec was created, most people were using enterprise-wide services, not public cloud. And so if you had your clients and your servers, let's say, all in the same building, then the likelihood of failure was greatly reduced. But now that the internet is, has all these public data centers span, spanning the globe and clients are in their automobiles or in their home offices or just walking around on a street with a cell phone, um, you know, we have network connectivity and there's a lot more chance for failure to occur. We're going to compensate for that with retries and idempotency and all cloud operations have to be implemented in an idempotent way. So what is the definition of idempotency? Well, it means that retrying a request has the same intended effect, even if the original requests already succeeded, although the response might differ. So the HTTP methods that we recommend that services use are put, patch, get, and delete. All of these methods, the HTTP specification says has to be um, idempotent. Well, actually, patch is defined as not having to be idempotent, but we recommend in using patch with a JSON merge patch payload. And when you use patch with JSON merge patch, then it is idempotent. And that's how we'll get idempotency with patch. So the put method is used to create or replace a whole resource. And your typical response from that, from the service, would be a 200 OK or a 201 created. Let's talk briefly about that. If the client makes a put request to a service and the service is creating this resource, then normally the service would return a 201 created back to the client. But in this um, world of embracing failure, the client may not get that 201 created and the client may retry the put operation again. When the client retries the put operation, they will just put the same exact resource state on top of what they just did a moment ago because they're retrying the same operation. So the resource, uh, updating the resource is idempotent and it will become the proper state. But should you return a 201 now? Because really the resource was created with the first request. Um, we would normally say, no, do not return a 201, return a 200 because now it's really an overwrite, not a created. So 201 in general is advisory to a, cost, to a client code. It says that you were the first one to create this thing, congratulations, but in the case of doing retries, you may not see the 201, you may get a 200. So clients have to be written to really accept any kind of 200 response as meaning success. It may or may not really see the 201 at all. So now let's talk about patch. Patch is really the same thing. Patch lets you create or modify the resource. And as I said before, we highly recommend using it with JSON merge patch, which is what makes patch item potent. And if you're using patch to create a resource, then you would return a 201 again. But if you're using patch to modify an existing resource, then you would return a 200 okay. And again, the 201 is advisory because a client may never actually see that if there's a timeout or some other failure and it just retries the operation. Get method goes and retrieves or reads a resource from the service. It is just natural item potent. That is if you called get twice, it would return the same value, unless it was changed in the middle, of course. And then usually we return a 200 okay with the get response. And then let's talk about delete. Delete removes a resource from the service. Um, if you delete a resource that's there, then you can return 200 with the response. That is, you can return back the state of the resource that you now just deleted. But what if you call delete again? Right? Let's say the first delete, it times out, and so you retry the delete. Well, the first delete actually may have deleted the resource. So now the service doesn't have the state anymore to return back to the client. And so in this case, the service should not return a 200 OK because it can't return the state of the resource. In this case, the service would return a 204 back saying, I have successfully deleted the resource, but there's no content. Now, sometimes people will implement delete to return a 404 not found. Um, this is problematic because if the client does the delete and then it retries the delete, it will now receive a 404. 
So the first delete could have succeeded, the second delete could have failed, and the client code will now think that it failed to do the delete. So we recommend that when you're implementing delete, you return either 200 or 204, and you do not return a 404. That'll make it easier for your clients to handle the delete. Right? It doesn't matter to them whether they actually deleted it or whether it was deleted prior to their request. The important thing to them is to know that it is not there on the service anymore. And the 200 and the 204 make that clear. You'll notice one of the methods I don't have in the table is the HTTP POST method. The HTTP POST method is one of those methods that is typically not item potent and therefore it's not well suited for cloud environments where we're embracing failure. So our recommendation is to avoid POST unless you make it item potent in some way. And there are a few different techniques available for doing this. One of them is to use the OASIS repeatable request. So you can go and look that up on the internet. That's a document that says, uh, describes some special headers that you can put into the POST request body so that you can get repeatable requests for doing retries without having the same operation performed multiple times. But typically, implementing this on a service is harder than using put, patch, get, and delete. And also, it's harder for the customer as well to use post. So you will be much better off if you can avoid post as much as possible. And so let's just take a close look at what is really the issue with using post, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So here's a scenario. Clients um, typically use POST to create a new resource on a service. And then the service creates that resource and returns some unique ID to identify the new resource back to the client. The problem, of course, is that the client may not get this response. So now the service has created the resource, but the client doesn't know that that has happened. If the client retries the POST, then the client's going to tell the service to create a new resource and now the service is going to be creating yet another resource. And these old resources, they're effectively getting leaked on the client and the customer doesn't know, they're, they're getting leaked on the service and the customer doesn't know that they're even being created. More retries will cause even more leaked resources. Um, and then if the customer later, let's say, enumerates the resources on the service, a bunch of resources might show up and the client will have no code, have no idea how they ever got there. So in the future, this enumerating of resources, these resources appear to have been created on their own, and the customer doesn't entrust the integrity of the service. Also, some services charge monthly for the resources to remain on the server. And when the customer receives a bill, the bill will be shocking to them. So this really hurts the customer's um, feelings towards the service in a very bad way. Whereas doing all the item potent things really increases that trust and fault tolerance for customers. Um, at Microsoft, I've done a lot of API reviews of services and almost all the APIs I've reviewed that have post in them have ignored this problem. They all assume that nothing will fail and everything will work correctly and the client's gonna get back the IDs, but in reality, they don't. So I've been working hard with teams to try to get them to build their services to be more fault tolerant. 